Hi, this is Josh Plotner, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical U, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm talking with Josh Plotner, a man who plays seemingly pretty much every woodwind instrument, from saxophones to flutes to recorders to clarinets, and a ton of world instruments that you may never have even heard of. Josh works on Broadway and also provides recording and arranging services both in person and over the internet, drawing on his amazingly broad wind skills. And he came across our radar because he also produces two fantastic kinds of YouTube video, one in which he very punctually explains the must-know rules for arranging for particular instruments in a sensible way, and the other in which he arranges popular music such as TV theme tunes for a variety of instruments and then plays every part himself. I wanted to know what had gone into the music education of a person who could do all this, and this conversation was truly enlightening. You're going to hear about Josh's early days and the surprising attitude that let him quickly learn more instruments than most of us have dreamed of ever playing. The one critical thing that Josh says is the essence to his attitude in learning, and which is simple, though perhaps not easy. And the amount of daily practice it took to juggle an endless array of ensembles and groups during his high school years, as well as the way he thinks about practicing now that lets him stay in shape on all those instruments. I know you're going to enjoy this episode, and I think it might provoke you to think differently about your own route in learning music, or to better understand the route you have chosen. And I must insist that you go immediately after finishing listening to this episode and check out some of Josh's YouTube videos. We'll have a few recommended favorites in the show notes for this episode. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Glad to be here. You are a quite remarkable musician for a number of reasons, and I would love to understand a bit more about where that came from, and in particular, how you became such a versatile multi-instrumentalist and arranger. If you wouldn't mind, could you take us right back to the beginning? What was the early music education like for you? Um, well, I guess the very beginning is uh, unfortunately terribly cheesy. I, uh, I started... Uh, I wanted to play saxophone since I was three years old, which wow. is just one of those super cheesy stories. And I was, I don't know, like at three, I was really into the idea. I thought it was the coolest thing. And my mom was like, eh, it's a phase. And my school system like lets you start picking up an instrument at um, 10. So, and, and my mom, it was funny, I, I still uh, call her out for this. Um, she took piano lessons as a kid and hated it. And she was like, maybe I should, like, if he's interested in music, maybe I should make him take piano lessons, but I don't want to force him because I hated it. And I had, like, an old, angry piano teacher. Um, so I never took piano. Still, I'm terrible at piano. Still angry at my mom for that. But um, I started saxophone at 10. Um, and, uh, and then... I ended up uh, really getting into it because uh, I really wanted to play it. Uh, I picked up clarinet my uh, right before high school, and then I kind of dropped it, came back to it a little later, picked up flute, uh, I think, freshman year in high school. Actually, I pretty much picked up uh, clarinet and flute actually, uh, in high school because um, saxophone parts in concert band are terrible. Um, <laughs> um, not terrible always. in what way? Like, they're usually just doubling the French horn part. It's kind of like being, like, the alto voice in a section and just, like, just... I mean, and there there are moments that are nice for saxophone, but, like, not nearly as cool as flute or clarinet. Like, no one's writing as good for saxophone in concert band as they are for flute and clarinet. And, uh, you know, it's, I guess, like, I have enough of an ego that I was like, no, I want to do the cool parts, though. <laughs> um... And so, so I convinced my band director, or well, I auditioned, and they started letting me play flute. Um, and then I got serious about flute, and then I did orchestra, obviously. There's the, what, the four piece, orchestral pieces for saxophone. Uh, so I started playing clarinet and orchestra and flute and concert band. Um, and then by senior year, I had a bunch of my friends be kind of angry at me because I was first chair 
and like the saxophone players stole their first chair seat. Sorry, guys, um, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I got serious about it, uh, and then I continued in college. Uh, in college, I ended up uh, at the end of college, finally picking up oboe a little bit reluctantly, um, and then and then yeah. Uh, so let me interrupt there for a second, if I may, and ask, because you, you kind of casually mentioned I picked this up, I picked that up, which I'm sure to a lot of our listeners is kind of surprising. Like, that sounds difficult. Yeah. Learning one instrument is difficult. Learning two or three must be really difficult. What, what were you doing to learn those instruments? Were you self-taught? Was it playing by ear? Were you reading from sheet music? Did you have a teacher? Uh, so I did. I did have a teacher. My mom was actually pretty great about helping me um, to like find teachers. And there was uh, at first there was one teacher who taught me everything, and then I ended up uh, having like uh, my high school life was a little crazy because I was taking lessons on all of those instruments. Um, actually, I was taking lessons on all of those instruments and a jazz saxophone lesson and a classical saxophone lesson. I was very nearly actually almost a professional classical saxophonist, but uh, that's actually an oxymoron. No. that's uh sorry it's the all. professional bit that makes it tricky huh so so sorry to classical saxophone is listening but you know you guys laughed a little bit at that uh um no but but i didn't want to do uh the the education thing as much and i really wanted to perform and um and yeah so but i was i was taking lessons on all of those instruments um uh and trying trying to really like pretend like um there's a great quote by uh Oh, I can't think of his who who it was. Um, a great clarinet player and doubler. Um, anyways, but he was like, uh, being a doubler is like uh, having like four girlfriends and none of them knowing each, about each other. Like that's that's what being a good doubler is about, you know. And so, explain for the audience who aren't familiar with the term, what's a doubler? Uh, a doubler is just someone who plays more than one instrument. Um, and the, the verb is always doubling. One of my pet peeves is like, people are like, so you're like a tripler or a quadrupler. No, 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 no. It's just like you're doubling as another thing. It's not, there's no math involved in that verb. <laughs> gotcha. So we've talked a few times here on the podcast about playing multiple instruments and in our kind of canonical blog post about musicality, it, we list that as one of the things it means to be musical, you know, to be able to play more than one instrument. And that does often take people by surprise because I think we have this cultural assumption that if you want to get to the highest level, you really need to focus in and just master one instrument. And maybe when you're a total virtuoso, you can think about picking up something else for pleasure. But I think that idea of the, you know, the concert pianist who plays nothing but piano from the age of three to 30 has us all thinking like that is the proper way to do it. And I know that for me, I had a similar, if smaller, story to yours in the sense that I played several instruments in high school and always felt very guilty about it. I felt like, you know, the serious musicians were doing their grade eight when I was still doing grade five. And it's because I played three instruments instead of one. I'd love to hear what do you think sent you in that direction? And do you think there were any obvious benefits to you in terms of who you became as a musician, apart from the practicality of, you know, being able to play in this band or get the more interesting parts? Sure, sure. I mean, well, I think uh, to, to that point about focusing on one thing and becoming perfect at it before you move on, um, it really depends on, on what your goals are. If you, if you like have a, a, an almost, and, and it's going to, I can't think of a nicer way to phrase it, but almost, if you have a blind passion, um, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing, but like if you're like, I want to play concert piano and that's, I don't care about anything else. That's amazing because actually your life is like very simple and you have like a very clear direction. Um, but most, most people unfortunately don't have as clear of a passion and enjoy lots of things. And, and in doing that, um, y you know, you're going to, uh, um, how do I phrase this? Uh, you're like, want, want to explore other things. And there is something so educational about, um, like understanding the pers different perspectives of different cultures are different things. And so I've always been really interested, um, ever since I was a kid in like other cultures, like I think it started out, uh, like I really liked taking French in school and then, um, that ended up, uh, broadening into a, a passion about languages. But, um, yeah, just, just, I was always interested in, uh, different cultures. And, um, from my experience, while, um, if you focus on one thing, you become amazing at it, but you also become 
it's a, it becomes a bit of a brittle skill. And um, as soon as uh, if you're a like an amazing classical musician, like I've heard some, um, I've worked with amazing violin players. Then it's like, please swing, like please play, <laughs> please play jazz. And they go da 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 da, da, da and everyone's like, oh, no. Um, and it's and it's because if you focus on only one thing, you should be prepared to become a very brittle kind of musician. And again, if that's what you want, if that's what makes you happy. That's awesome. And again, like an, a much more clear way to live one's life than the complexity of having a bunch of interests. It's like, I'm like 3% interested in this and like 67% and like 15. I mean, that's a bit of a mess, but that's a little more common than the pure passion. Um, and there's nothing wrong with either of those. Um, but uh, so, so, so yeah, but like I, I've always loved um, being able to look at things from different perspectives. And I've actually, I found things like... Um, this is always a, a better as a visual demonstration, but uh, the way that one lays back, especially in like a big band swing thing, is found in orchestral music in the way that, um, like, and I find just from like having played at serious levels of both, uh, the way that the ictus is usually not at the bottom, like the a conductor will throw it on the baton and then it comes up a little bit and that's where the beat is. That's that feeling of the beat. And it is, even though, uh, most orchestral music doesn't really groove. You're still feeling the beat in a way. That's a very similar emotion to when, like, instead of in a big band, they're going like da 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 ah, opposed to like da 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 da. It's a very similar, just like pulling the music. Same emotion, different context, and mm. and and um and I I only realized that because and and I feel like it strengthened me and um because I studied jazz pretty seriously, it gave me a bit of a head start when I started doing orchestral things. Because um, like uh, syncopated rhythms come a little bit later in a classical education and they're like, jazz, like, let's go, what are you doing? Like, all we're doing is syncopated rhythms. And I like very quickly was able to find the similarities. And it's really, I mean, there's, to me, there's nothing about them that's like oil and water. You can really um, mix them in like a, in, no, because not mix them in like a Gershwin way, but just like uh, the the passion and the mindset, it's really like saying the same thing, but switching the language, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah. That's super interesting. And I think it would be easy for people to assume, and this was definitely my fear when I was a teenager, that if you do spread yourself a bit thinner like that, you're never going to get to a good level on any of the instruments. And you obviously went on to study at Berkeley. Were you practicing each of those instruments seven hours a day to get to that standard? Or, you know, how did you manage to fit all that in? Um, I mean, the way that it ended up working really is that, because I'm actually terrible at self-motivation, honestly. I'm, I'm pretty bad at it. Uh, I'm pretty bad at regular discipline practice schedules. But what I am good at is throwing myself into situations where people are going to expect me to be good. Um, and I really don't like the feeling of other people being disappointed in me. And so that's, that's my form of uh, internal, external motivation. Um, and so, but playing with ensemble, so I would just be like, yeah, I can play flute and do that thing. And, and then they, I'd be there and I'd be expected to. And so I did. Um, was when I first started learning oboe, I had I had no right for I I told them that I could play. Um, there's this uh, amazing singer coming to to Berkeley for this concert. Her name is Susana Baca. She's a, a Peruvian, like a really famous like Peruvian like traditional singer. She's incredible. And they were like, "Do you want an oboe solo, like an improvised oboe solo?" And I was like, "Yeah, I can do that." After having played oboe for like four months. Um, Oboe is not an instrument you can be even a little bit good at in four months. <laughs> uh, and, you know, but it, like, it's not the worst because, like, there was just so much pressure that it it made it happen for me. So the spreading yourself thin, it's, it's a tricky thing because some people use it as an excuse. There's a, there, it's, it really de depends on, it's a personality thing because for some people, they, um, there is a fear and everyone has this fear of like a fear of seeing how good you can ever get and like a fear of knowing what your best is because what if it's not good enough? 
And so you're like, well, what if I, and you, and you don't do this really consciously, but it's just under consciously where you're like, well, if I just do a bunch of things, I can always have that excuse that it's like, oh, well, I never fully put myself in it. So I, I would be that good. And it's like this very convenient excuse that really everyone does. This is like, I would, I would be that good. It's just, I, it didn't work out that way. And it's, and, and so some people use doing a bunch of things as a crutch and, uh, that's uh, that's not a good way to do it because that that does I mean that leads to just unfortunate like people who kind of do everything and are kind of bad at everything and I don't know, um, so how do you avoid that? Uh, I mean, if 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 your person if you have as strong of a personality um, that if you have the kind of it's, it's really a personality thing. It's not a universal thing. It's kind of the the problem with it. If you have a personality that tends towards excuses and like uh, like let it give uh, giving yourself an excuse and letting yourself get away with stuff, uh, it's a very dangerous road to go down. Um, or just really, I mean, in that case, you can still do a bunch of things, but getting really amazing at one thing helps so much because. It, at some point, you have to have an understanding of what excellence is. You have to have an understanding of what uh, being elite is. And if and if you have that in something, I really it doesn't even have to be a musical. Like just like an understanding of the feeling of like that elite kind of focus and drive. Then you can go into other things knowing that that's kind of a standard and that's what it feels like to actually be there. But if you never get there with anything that can be a huge hindrance because then you're like, oh, I'm fine. And um, uh, the perfect uh, explanation uh, is the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is this psychological phenomenon that uh, the short version is that people who are untalented think they're talented because they don't understand the scope of talent. Uh, and a lot of people who are talented don't think they're talented because they understand the scope of talent. Um, uh, there's... Uh, look up Dunning Kruger effect is the, the easiest. Way. Yeah, yeah um, we will definitely have a link in the show notes. Yes. Um, I, I think I've heard it described as expertise more than talent. So people who, you, sure, it's yeah. kind of you don't know what you don't know, and a lot of people think they're better than they are because they've never really been exposed to what it means to know that thing in detail. That, it's always that's that, but the opposite is true too because people who are really talented know how much they suck. Like, <laughs> because if you if you're really good, it's like I honestly think i'm pretty terrible at what i do but uh, the other people haven't seemed to figure that out yet <laughs> so i just i just kind of go with it but like i can i can go on and on and tell you why i'm terrible at every instrument i play and all the things i do and like all my flaws uh and you know they might be as legitimate or illegitimate as as you think but like i guess i guess that might be a sign that i have an understanding because i can go on and on about how terrible i am um Whereas, um, yeah, I, I think sticking in the world of psychology, they call that the imposter syndrome. Yes. And yeah, yeah. I think it's one we've all suffered from. Oh, yeah. I don't know any professional musicians who don't have imposter syndrome. Um, so you talked there about getting to the elite level and getting to the point where you can really understand what it means to be top tier in something. And for you, I guess, one place that came out was at Berkeley. Was there any... Were there any musical experiences before that point we i think you told your story up until kind of high school time um from there to berkeley was it a matter of taking those lessons every week studying those instruments was there anything else that helped you get to that elite level yeah i um studied at this outside of uh school like this weekend uh, music school called midwest young artists which is in chicago which uh i i feel like i owe most of my talent to honestly it's it's such an amazing school shout out to midwest young artists um and uh, I was I was in I was in so many ensembles. I think what it really was is that I spread myself thin and was expected to perform well, and that and I was and it, and it didn't crush me. I was able to like do it because um, I was so in high school in my high school band, which wasn't the like the most amazing high school, but I was in the concert band and the jazz band. Um, I was in the marching band for a minute and I was in like a saxophone quartet. So, so that was just at school in this other music school, which was the weekends. And it also became like Wednesday and Tuesday evenings, I think. But there I was in 
their orchestra. I was in the big band. I was in uh, a chamber ensemble that played the music of Eighth Blackbird, which is this really cool um, modern uh, chamber ensemble. Uh, so we played that. I was playing clarinet in that, and I was playing in a competitive saxophone quartet. I'm like the high school one was uh, just kind of fun, but the one at Midwest Young Artists, we uh, qualified for the, the fish off comp. We were the first saxophone quartet. The, our, my claim to fame is that uh, we were the first saxophone quartet to qualify for the junior version of the fish off competition, which is like this huge uh, American, uh, or no, it might be international. This is a chamber music competition and saxophone quartets are usually snubbed, but now more and more they're not being snubbed. Um, but yeah, so I was in, I have to count, I don't know, somewhere between like seven and 10 ensembles simultaneously. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so honestly, uh, the the skill I developed a lot because I didn't practice for everything. I didn't prepare every piece of music for everything, but I got really good at um, a, uh, in high school because I was doing uh, all those things. And honestly, I think that is one of the most important skills going through life is being able to not quite know what you're doing, but seem like you know what you're doing because it's a very, you know, fake it till you make it. It's like, the, but it really, like the first step in getting good at something is just convincing other people. It's, and so, it, you know, uh, there are different journeys, but convincing other people that you're good at something because once they believe it, maybe you can start to believe it. And that's, for, for someone like me at least, my, that's my only hope is that <laughs> is that other people believe it and then they convince me. Um, gotcha. Do you, do you have the phrase "black it" in the U.S.? Would you say yeah. to black it? No. So in the U.K. or the or in Ireland, we would describe that as blacking it. You know, you just show up and you black your way through. And yeah. I, I think that that's a valid skill. It's a valid skill to have. And I definitely, I mean, I'm a also, believer. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it is a real skill. Like because that's what sight reading is. Sight reading is very <laughs> no, but like people, it's a, it's a very like being a good sight reader is a, an honorable and important thing as a musician, but blagging it, like faking it is, you know, that's cheating. It's as sight reading is entirely pretending you already knew the music that you've seen for the first time. Um, that's, that's all it is. Like it's, it's just, we have a word that makes it sound a lot nicer, uh, in the context of music. Um, yeah, I think one of my big life lessons as a teenager was the idea that the way to be confident is to act confident. Yeah, and genuinely, oh, that that is what it takes. Like you just pretend like you are confident, and over time, you realize that that works, and you can kind of just become a confident oh, person. I wish I wish someone had, had told me earlier that it turns out like really no one has any clue what they're <laughs> doing at all. Like <laughs> like you find that's like well, your parents didn't really know what they were doing, and like. The president does. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> the president doesn't know what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, let's not go there uh, on this podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, that skill of blagging it, it it's it, crazy important. But at the same time, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are like, really? Like this guy that graduated from Berkeley and does all of these amazing jobs in session music for TV and playing on Broadway. Like, really? Does he really not, you know, study seven hours a day on each of these instruments and really master each of them? Uh, no, because it's, it's, it's really, it, it can be about that, but it's, it's really more about, um, putting like, just uh, for me, it's, it's about having high expectations for myself and trying not to let myself and others down. And it becomes very easy to do what I do. Um, not, not out of like uh, a theoretical concept of practicing, but out of a practical real world, like this is what I want to happen and this is what I'm like, like clear goals. Um, and I mean, I, I, when I think about it, I, I say I don't practice a lot, but it's because it doesn't, I don't do a lot of um, like structured sitting down and playing scales and doing etudes. Although I did at some point and that's different, definitely important scales and etudes especially when you're starting out very important. Um, but at this point it's, it doesn't feel like practicing, even though I'm, I, I'll be learning something, but, uh, it's, it's more like playing. Um, and, uh, this is where the, the English language has a bit of an unfortunate homonym here because it's not, I'm like not playing music, but playing as in approaching music with a sense of play. Um, and I'm just like, Oh yeah, this is like, I just want to figure this out and make this thing work and be able to do this. It's not 
but there's for me there's a little bit less structure and a little bit more of a natural thing um i was watching uh an interview with jacob collier that really resonated with me where he's like yeah i've never practiced but he'll like he'll sit at his computer or whatever for like seven hours and be doing music but it's not practicing um but again it's all it all depends on goals like if you're if you're um, trying to be a concert pianist and you're trying to be able to play chromatic scales at blazing tempos, that requires practice. Um, because uh, so pra- practice can be a few different things. Like um, one of the things that practice does is build muscles for just about every instrument. You literally need to make your muscles work better, um, and you need to develop those. If you got if you're if the brain of an amazing musician got transported into the body of a non musician. They wouldn't be good at, they'd be able to kind of make it work, but they wouldn't have any technique because you just need the physical muscles and like practice is perfect for like the structured thing of just like, yeah, because that's, that's really how your body works. The brain is a little bit more of a wishy-washy, or it can be, again, it's, it's very much a personality thing. Like trying to be universal about it is, I, I think, um, ends up leaving a lot of people out. Uh, if you try to make universal rules about how to practice and how to, Blah blah blah. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, that was just a long so time, wasn't it? it? No, fantastic. But uh, what I was interested to ask you next was, you'd been playing all of these different styles, different instruments, and I think we've got a sense of how you were approaching that. You got into Berkeley, presumably at that point, you were like, right, now it's just jazz saxophone forevermore. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'm really glad. I actually so I went to uh, Northwestern University uh, in Chicago for a year, and uh, I I didn't resonate very strongly with the the jazz program, uh, and so I, I ended up transferring to Berkeley, and I was like, cool, jazz, 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 like find a good jazz school. And then at Berkeley, I didn't realize I should have done more research, I guess. Um, I mean, Berkeley has a great jazz program, but uh, the cool thing to me about Berkeley ended up being that it's the uh, school with the highest percentage of international students in the country. Um, not the most, inter- I mean, it's only a school of 4,000 people, but by percentage, it's the highest amount of international students. And so like half of my friends ended up being from South America, uh, and the Middle East, um, like I had friends from like really all over the world, like after like two or three years of Berkeley and then I'd be like, wow, I could stay most places in Europe, South America, like a couple places in Asia, not not to, there aren't a lot of there were a few African students at Berkeley, not too many, but like Berkeley is pretty amazingly international. And so like I got really into Latin music, um, and uh, like I, it was it was really interesting too because um, I mean Latin music is like saying I got Latin music is a huge umbrella, um, but I got I got my mind blown by things like. Uh, uh, oh man, I was I was so so young. Um, in in Argentina, they have a rhythm called um, chacarera, and it sounds like a waltz. Um, and I mean, the waltz is also kind of an Argentine thing. But the the bass plays like one, two, three, two, three, two, three, one, two, three, and it's like it's in three, and the rhythm goes and um, they all feel it in six eight, and when when the bass is going, what what would be two three and three four becomes three five in, out of six eight, and all of a sudden it's really hip because the bass isn't playing one and the bass isn't playing four and it's in six eight and they're, so they're all like, uh, well these claps work on this mic so like that that uh, wait, uh, bump 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 bump. And it's this like really cool. I might have done that mm, wrong. Uh, it's kind of we'll, lurching. We'll fix it in post. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but it's like this like uh, cool thing. And I was like trying to explain to them. I was like, no, no, no. Like I studied a bunch of like Western classical music, and like clearly, if the bass is going two, three, two, three, we're in three, and they're also not playing one. That's a bit of a strange. Why aren't you playing one? And I just I realized that. Um, like I just got so excited when I got my mind blown. We're like, no, it's in six. Like here's the beat, and then. Um, yeah, especially the world of, I think, South American music really opened me up to the rest of music because while uh, typically uh, traditional music from South America is often harmonically fairly simple, um, the rhythm is so deep. Um, and I mean, I, they there are a lot of, for all practical purposes, unnotatable rhythms where it's just like you'd have to, to really like 
get exactly what they're playing. You'd have to use like crazy tuplets that are unreadable and at that point like pointless because it is about a, a feeling thing. Um, but yeah, feeling bigger beats. And it was crazy too when I ended up doing that that concert with Susanna Baca. Uh, Peruvian music is an even more complicated concept than uh, uh, Argentine because they take that concept of 6, 8, and 3, 4 and do it in 9 a lot of the time. Um, and And there was an audience of people all clapping, like people, uh, non-musicians, and they were all clapping, and I was like, I don't know what they're clapping. Like, (laughs) I'm I'm a trained musician, and like, I don't know what these, all these people are like, just like, hearing, I was like, what? Like, I could like, imitate them by like, watching their hands and trying to time my hands with the hands, but like, it's like, how does this relate to the music, and how is the whole audience doing this, and why don't I, as a trained musician, understand a simple clapping along to this music? Um... That was really exciting for me to like just really get my mind blown that there's so much more out there than uh, because there is a bit of a, a hubris to the the Western side of music the the classical and the jazz it's like we have the 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 deepest ugh, I hate saying that like the it's like it's like the tradition is like it's like we've gotten to the base of music theory and the undercurrent and there's like there's a lot we're missing like. Um, I mean, I was my mind is always blown by. I slowly more and more I'm getting into Hindustani stuff from India, and that stuff again. Uh, harmonically, like there's not a, that much to talk about. Although the scales are interesting, and you know, people people talk about the microtones, but they they kind of, at least my understanding is like they actually kind of essentially use a chromatic scale with microtonal ornaments that are used in a specific way. Like it's not just. Like you're jumping from do to fa flat or something. Um, it's it's really like it's like to get to that note, you're playing another note, and it's that like that that systemized. But I mean, the rhythmic thing, and they're like uh, again, especially in the Hindu time, they have like half hour like forms that you memorize in like crazy counting systems that just that a Western you like if you just threw in a Western musician. Even if you like tried to like start to explain to them, they'd, be, they'd have to shed for years. Um, and yeah, it was uh, so Berkeley being so international. It was so nice to um, be like stripped of my concept. That I was like, yeah, jazz and classical music are like it's like really deep, like art forms um, because there there really is so much more. And 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 just because and and also just finding like the empathy and and enjoying. Um, other art form, and eventually, and like I came the long way around to appreciating pop music because I was like always a jazz musician, and like like jazz musician first, classical musician close second, and like pop was like <laughs> pop, and, <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna sound uh, so pretentious, um, but it, it almost became like an exercise in empathy, and I found a way to enjoy pop, and that like I was like okay, so what are all these people hearing? And try to hear it like them, and I mean, you can really do that. And there's there's cool stuff in pop too. Um, like, but pop, but it, but pop's not about the harmony. It's not really about the rhythm. It's kind of got like this other feeling to it. But there's, I mean, also pop's really cool. Like, uh, if you get into the world of production, like, oh my god, the best, some of the best producers and engineers are pop ones, and like the things they can do, um, which is also why uh, I I have a bit of a theory. I think I probably stole this from someone, but. Like the reason uh, jazz and classical music aren't that popular is because the engineers that usually do the work on them is not great. Like, you're like if you've spent ten years working on how to figure out negative harmony, uh, you're going to lose the guy who spent ten years making a good snare sound, because it at the end of the day, like if you're talking about like uh, appealing to a large audience, like it's about pre- like presentation is the first barrier. And if you, like, don't uh, have the empathy to, like, get through uh, having a good presentation to give whatever the, the meat of your subject is to your audience, you're kind of screwed. Now, so, like, the problem with pop is that, for me at least, they get, like, stuck in presentation. It's, like, all presentation and no substance. But, like, the problem with a lot of, like, modern jazz or especially, like, the direction, like, modern classical music is going or neoclassical music or, you know, is that it's all substance and no presentation. And... Um, and while it works for those who enjoy it, it it displays a lack of empathy that I think is I don't know, for me it's un, unfortunate that it's not you know yeah I I like for me I like the balance of like just kind of understanding a little bit where everyone's coming from trying to to get your message understood in a more 
without without you don't have to corrupt your message to make it presentable. You know, you just have to have a little bit of yeah, a little bit more empathy. But yeah, so Berkeley gave me a lot, uh, like really just broadened my just by meeting people from other countries with other languages, other perspectives, um, and finding out that uh, everything's really this like everyone is very similar. Um, and so one thing that ended up being really cool, so I got into world music, which uh, started getting me into world flutes. Um, and uh, and then I ended up uh, really getting into it when I uh, moved to New York. My story of really getting into world flutes is that I moved to New York. I wanted to sub on Broadway as a young musician with not a lot of connections. That's a woodwind player. The woodwind world is really hard to break into when you're young. You really need connections or teachers. Uh, it's different for every every instrument on Broadway at least has its own kind of rules like drummers and like uh, music directors like a lot of cool young people woodwinds is like it's a much more it's it's just an older group of people that's got like they've already got it figured out a little bit more um, but so I wanted to sub on Broadway and I was like what if I try for uh, the Lion King which has all these crazy flutes and I was already interested in world flutes um, and so I I learned all these, these flutes and I got really deep into it. Um, and back to my original point, the cool thing about world flutes that really unifies uh, humanity is that all these cultures across the world hundreds of years ago invented kind of the same thing. Um, the mechanic, like, so very impressive. If you look at my website or something, you're like, wow, this guy plays like 40, I don't know, 40. Or no, it's probably not 40. It depends. It depends really how you count it. Like with the instruments. Cause like, you know, I play like Bonsuri and C and Bonsuri and F. Like, are those the same instrument? But are, like, is alto and tenor sax the same instrument? Like, is is piccolo clarinet and bass clarinet the same instrument? Because you like you can't just like pick those up and play them. Or it, you know, it gets great. Um, I play a couple dozen instruments, probably at least, but they're kind of the same actually. A lot of them, like, it's really cool that like, um, for instance. The, there's a technique that you find in uh, Irish flute, or uh, so Irish flute and tin whistle, uh, where you you're playing you're playing a note and to rearticulate the note you don't tongue it. Uh, you like you very quickly hit your finger on the note below so it sounds like da 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 instead of da da da. Um, it's a very Irish technique. Japanese use the exact same technique on shakuhachi. Um, it's they they have they think of it differently, but as someone from my perspective, who's not like so entrenched in the culture that I don't have like, cause I, I just have kind of an outsider perspective on all these things a little bit. And I'm trying to always have a deeper insider perspective. It's the exact same technique. Um, they, uh, and the, so you find like, you know, an Irish people and Japanese people 300 years ago, definitely weren't trading like musical concepts and, and and it's cool too because they use the those techniques it sounds way different when you play it um on kwachi versus a tin whistle uh and like just like um ways to uh create uh also the japanese shakuhachi again uh is blown it's like a really very hard instrument to make noise out of i can't imagine how like people uh it's also japanese is also based off of the chinese shao but either way um that instrument, the way you make sound out of it, it takes a week to make noise. Like I can, it's 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 a fun thing I do. If I ever meet like a professional flute player, I'm like, this is a flute, make noise. It it takes a week to be able to like really make it. It's just a very very strange embouchure. I can't imagine how anyone invented that. But they also did the same thing in like uh, the Andes with the the kenna. Um, is this like Andean flute like in Peru um, and it's this it's a it's a it's almost identical the way you play it and there's no way that people in south america hundreds of years ago were like working with chinese and japanese musicians on flutes and but this thing like i highly encourage if you're ever around like you'll you'll see ken is probably more often because they're always like seem to be peruvian like bands like playing in town squares somewhere but there's like a a, a vertically blown flute and if you look at it it's just a cylinder with a hole and like a tiny divot in it and to make noise on that is so such a weird thing to do with your face, um, and it's so world flutes for me like really like created this like unified thing of like wow like people are all really the same and it's always like I mean I mean physics kind of demands it but like it's always the same like the fingerings are almost like very much the same. Um, just like two weeks ago, I bought a Native American flute, and in about fifteen minutes, I was like I could play a gig on this like I. 
I've played this instrument for 15 minutes and I'm like, yeah, I get it because it's kind of the same. Um, and it, but to be clear, like I don't get Native American traditional music. I don't like have that depth of quality, but like have, I listened to it. I like kind of like heard the, the general things that they do with it. And I'm like, oh, I know how to do that already because I've played other instruments and it's like a little bit of this, a little bit of this. Um, but it, it is really cool how amazingly similar all music there is kind of a unifying thread that it's just like humans are humans at the end of the day. Um, so th- that touches on something I was really keen to ask you about, which is not just different instruments, but different styles of music. So part of your work is as an arranger. And I know you arrange in partly Latin styles, but also rock or classical. And I'd love to understand what what your approach is in the sense of balance between intellectual music theory understanding and you know this is how an itch, uh, how a, a fugue works in classical music or this is what a bachata sounds like mm. in terms of rhythms versus just kind of tuning your ear in and having that instinct for each of the styles how much is it a, a conscious process if you were to sit down and try and write or arrange something in one of those styles um what i do is i um I know a lot of music theory, like it's something that like resonates uh, pretty, pretty strongly with me. It's just like a fun because it's like solving math problems that are really easy. Like if you if you ever remember in school, like you were doing addition at a very young age, and like you kind of had it down, and it was like you had homework, and it was just like filling in the boxes, and it kind of felt good because you were just like check check, like I can do this. It's easy and it's fun, and I'm that's what music theory like feels like for me. It's just. So I, I, I've, I'm very deep in it, uh, and I use almost none of it when I'm arranging. Um, in that, I use it as a tool um, to help me fix things. It's I don't use it at all really as a creative tool. Um, so when I'm if I'm arranging and I'm trying to arrange in a style, uh, if I'm not if and sometimes I'm not like feeling like 100% confident, so I'll just like check out some recordings that I know are good and just kind of like pretend like to really or not pretend but like actually like get into the mindset of like okay like today like right now i'm i'm a latin musician like i'm really like like i am an argentinian musician again i'm not but the pretending makes it so much more than coming from a place of the outside you know just pretend you're an insider do something and then also be ready to accept criticism obviously at the end of the day but so so i go i i I really just like use my ear, go with my instincts, and the music theory comes in uh, in that it's uh, a helpful tool for whenever I get stuck, that's where the music theory comes in. I'm like, why isn't this, oh, that's a minor ninth. You can't write a minor ninth. They almost always sound bad unless it's a flat seven, or seven, dominant seven flat nine chord, and the root in the flat ninth. But besides that, they usually don't, but there are also exceptions. Um, I could talk all day about theory. Uh, But it's, for me, it's a bit of a hindrance because it creates robotic music. Um, and it's like one thing I always hated, uh, this is kind of, I I actually just try to pick fights with this. Like I, I hate, um, in, uh, most college education when they're doing counterpoint, I think counterpoint is a huge waste of time. (laughs) I think it's a waste of everyone's time. Um, it's an interesting like game to play, but I don't think it's useful to, because it's it's based off of the work of famous classical composers, and none of the famous classical composers actually followed those guidelines. Um, yeah, I if anyone wants to send me messages and pick fights about whether or not counterpoint should be part of music education, I will I will gladly do that. But um, it's uh, the 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 theory helps is just a tool for analysis and like in reflection and editing, but it's it's not that useful for creative um and actually the um the biggest thing that theory does that i appreciate is that it uh gives you names for things and um it's kind of if if anyone has read the book 1984 the the evil government that like one of the their big things big brother is trying to like get rid of words to control the population if you flip that on its head the more words you have the more power you have and so what theory does is it gives you names for the sounds that you're hearing. And when you have names, you can think of them better and you can use them better. When you don't have names, it's harder to work with them. So the more words, the better. The fact that like 
when you say, oh, that's a major tenth, I'm like, I know it has like that beautiful, nice, resonant sound that makes me kind of feel like this. Like, I, I have feelings attached to that name, and it's so much, because without that name, like, you'd have to play me a tenth. Um, and so, like, for talking with other music, also, you essentially can't speak music. If you can't speak music theory, so, like, if you don't want to learn music theory, I would, uh, just collaborations will be terrible, because it'll it'll be like yelling at someone who doesn't speak your language and just like waving your hands around trying to get them to understand something. It's like, why can't you understand? It's because you can't speak music. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's that's it's easily the most useful skill. And um, for me, one thing I've I've actually found in my professional, especially with um, my my studio things, uh, a skill I've had to develop that I'm glad I have is that I've been able to. Sp- learn to speak non-musician but uh because uh in my home studio business uh i do a lot of professional work for people all over the world and not all of them are highly trained musicians and so sometimes someone will be like yeah uh i want you to play it like softly and sweetly with good frequencies and like like this and it's like that kind of means nothing um and especially like it'll be like a thing that's not like a it's not like a lullaby it's just like it's just like the saxophone line it's not like a screaming solo but it's just like it's just and like oh i'm like oh he means play it well like (laughs) um um, but so i've i've had to learn how to translate that but that's because i'm like i do this as a like professional career is like translating people not understanding music uh into something that like i'm like this is what they want um but if you're if you're collaborating with someone, that's a very dangerous way to do it because a lot of people don't speak non-musician, if you will. That's a it's also a language that you can never master. You can just get less bad at. Um. So on that note, one of the other remarkable things about you is that, as well as finding time to acquire all of these instrument skills, you also speak several languages. And I, I think there's been various research done on the similarities between languages and music in terms of brain development. And often we do find that the people who are good at learning languages are good at learning instruments. But I'd love to hear your perspective on that and whether you know one influenced the other in terms of you being willing or keen or able to pick up multiple languages. I don't know if they necessarily influence each other in in such a direct correlation like like your your question suggested suggested but um what is really useful to me about uh just knowing languages is that i think the most important thing one can do just as a person is constantly be learning and like uh the uh pseudoscience alert um but like keeping your brain like like neuroplasticity uh, to me is uh, like just very important. Like the more you learn, the better you get at learning, and the easier learning is. Um, and languages, I mean, besides the fact that it's just a cool skill to have, languages is just like an infinite pool of things to learn. Like you know, you can pretty quickly like learn all the capitals of the countries, or like learn like like you know. Uh, but languages, and it's just like they languages specifically. There's nothing quite like it, where it just creates like these interconnections in your brain different ways to express things just um it, it keeps your brain so much more flexible in such a quick direct way because even like learning facts and figures um it's there's there's no uh elasticity to it it's just a, it's like a very uh simple thing that your brain is doing but when you're like learning japanese and you're trying to be like oh so the verb always ends like is at the end of the sentence and i have to you know, conjugate for politeness, but not for pronouns. Um, and, you know, under like something like that. Uh, it's it just so good for your brain. And I feel like that I feel like allows me. Um, yeah, just to just to like keep things flexible and it makes picking things up easier because I, I have found like uh, I just I get into like this learning mode where um, uh I, I just it's, it becomes like I pick things up more quickly the more I'm learning, and there are like times like where I like oh I haven't been like learning a language for four months or something like I haven't been studying anything and things feel a little bit slower, um, and it's just like 
learning is a skill. If there if there's one thing to take from this this whole interview for like from my perspective, like my big like learning is a skill and it's a thing you can get better at, and it's a thing where there are techniques. Uh, and the fact that every school system in the world doesn't have classes on learning is just a waste of everyone's time. Like, um, yeah, knowing how to learn and being good at learning changes the game. Because that allows you to play a ton of instruments in a ton of styles, and it not to be hard. Because also, like, uh, yeah, any situation I'm in where there's something I don't know, I, I, I sometimes make mistakes twice, but it's rare because it's really easy for me. Like I make a mistake, I'm like, oh, that, don't do it anymore, done. <laughs> and it's, that's only easy because I'm always making mistakes because I'm always learning. When you're learning, you get, learning is just making mistakes, right? If you don't know something, you're failing at it. Um, and then once you've learned it, you stop failing at it. And so if you just are always failing at things and you get good at failing less often and less consistently that's i mean yeah and I, I feel like language is just the easiest thing to it's it's almost it doesn't even have to be about learning the language itself it's more about like just brain gymnastics it's the best kind of brain gymnastics that i'm aware of yeah. nice and i think we've definitely picked up a few insights about how you have learned to learn uh, for example, it's clear you are not someone who shies away from a challenge or sees that there's a whole new opportunity to learn and just kind of stays in what you're comfortable with. And we've also talked a bit about how sometimes spreading yourself thin and having external accountability has helped you to really kind of follow through. You've talked about how, you know, for you, it's not so much practicing as maybe preparing is a suitable word. You'll put in the yeah. time, but it's not drills and exercises. But I think given what you just said about the centrality of learning to learn, I'd be remiss if I did not at least ask, were there any particular teachings or mentors or observations that helped you become a good learner? Um, uh, I think it comes down to specifically, um, I have this philosophy of like, uh, of that just, I really don't like being wrong or like, no, no, sorry. Let me, let me start over. I, I want to be right all the time, just like everyone else does. And in pursuit of that, I, try so hard to fail and I try so hard to be wrong because whenever you find and whenever you find out that you're wrong that gives you the opportunity to be right forever so in any sort of debate when like it's there it's it's a very emotional thing and like in like a, a debate's a better example than music but it, it, the same principle applies like you're arguing with someone and you get that inkling that you're wrong uh, and you fight it and you're like, let me just hold on to my thing and like prove that I'm right even though I'm not feeling so good about this. I've learned to force myself to just embrace being wrong because then I get to be right and then I get to be more right than I used to be. And so I love being wrong and I love failing because then I get to suck less than I did before. <laughs> and, that's, Beautiful. and that's, yeah, that's my biggest flaw is like seeking out failure and and incorrectness so that you're not that anymore in in pursuit of being right so yeah so whenever especially uh, the easiest thing is whenever i'm in an argument like it uh, it's sometimes jarring for people like if they'll be like yeah and da -da -da. i'm like oh no you're right never mind okay <laughs> sorry no it's, yeah it's just like that one because it's it's really more satisfying to be right at the end of the day. And then, cause it's, man, it's too much work to hold on to like being wrong. To, and, but it's, it's a very human thing. It's a very emotional thing to do. And it feels, it feels right, but it's so much more satisfying to just, but, and so, yeah, so just always seeking out. Right. And, and that's what putting myself in all those situations that I don't necessarily belong in holding other people accountable to me. Cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail. And when I fail, I get the opportunity to not fail again, or at least not fail again in the same way. And that, you know, just onwards and upwards. Fantastic. I love that. Well, you know, I think if there's a downside to being as versatile as you are, it's that my job as an interviewer is incredibly hard, and I have several <laughs> more things I would love to ask you about, but I think sure. we're going to have to save it know. for a part two. 
and um, maybe invite you back onto the show another time. I do want to just briefly touch on each of your current projects because you're doing several really interesting things. And the the one that jumped out to me and that will definitely link up in the show notes for everyone to go dive into is your arranging tutorials on YouTube. For example, I just watched one today on how to arrange for clarinet in two minutes, and this is not to be missed. Fantastic. You're also offering private lessons on some or all of the instruments you play and you do session work as we've mentioned both in person and remotely i'd love if you could just talk a little bit more about those projects and if anyone's interested in connecting with you regarding those where they can find you sure um so first if you want to reach out to me uh, my website joshplotnermusic.com uh or joshplotnermusic.com slash contact is my contact page uh feel free to send me a message and i'll get back to you uh, as quick as i can um so the YouTube thing, the uh, the uh, I have a bunch of videos on how to arrange for a series of woodwinds, and I'm uh, I'm about to I have I've been away from my YouTube channel. I'm about to restart it, uh, but the the series on arranging for woodwinds uh, came from a bit of a frustration of that there are, for each instrument uh, there there are like ten things you need to know, and I can tell you them in two minutes uh, ish, um, and and it's just it's just there are so many common mistakes that everyone makes like you can't write a forte and on a low note for flute that's not the way flutes are like it's just it's you're writing an impossible thing and you're kind of like wasting everyone's time and it's a thing is like just don't do that and then we're done and then moving on um so i have that um i do offer private lessons and then i do uh, a lot of home studio work professionally i can record any instrument uh for a sort of project uh um yeah, and I also um, have on my YouTube channel. I also do sometimes uh, covers, woodwind co- multi track woodwind covers, the kind of you know, just showing off. They are fantastic. I think, you know, if anyone's thinking, can he really record any instrument for me, you've got to check out these YouTube videos. Um, you may have seen this kind of video where you have multiple versions of the same person contributing to a musical track, but these with Josh are fantastic. He does the Game of Thrones theme, and uh, my favorite was the. Nightmare Before Christmas, what's it called? Uh, This is Halloween. Fantastic. Uh, We'll definitely have links to those in the show notes. So if you want to be inspired and impressed and see Josh (laughs) in action, I'd say that is where to start. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you again so much, Josh. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. And there was a ton of insight there, I think, for anyone who's wondered about playing multiple instruments, anyone who's thought about arranging, or really just this big picture of learning to learn. Um, I know they're going to be going away with lots of new ideas. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. I loved that conversation. I had done my background research on Josh and I knew it would be interesting to talk with him, but there were a few big themes and insights there that I hadn't anticipated. So let's do a quick recap. Josh wanted to play sax from the age of three and he started at ten. He picked up other instruments along the way, with lessons and a shocking number of ensemble groups. That might sound like he was the gifted kid, but it emerged during the course of the conversation that Josh doesn't seem to consider himself particularly gifted in his ability to play multiple instruments. For him, it's the natural byproduct of putting himself in situations where he needs to do new things, and setting expectations with other people that he then needs to live up to. For example, agreeing to play an oboe solo in a high-profile gig when he had only started playing oboe a few months earlier. I thought one of the most interesting points was the slight subtlety to his attitude about playing multiple instruments. When we've written or podcasted about this at Musical U in the past, I'll be honest, we've mostly focused on the positive, all the benefits you get, both in playing the additional instrument and the internal development it produces, which then helps you with your primary instrument too. And that is all true, but I did really like that Josh pointed out the psychological factor, that for certain personality types, it's going to work well to spread yourself thin, essentially to throw yourself in at the deep end and be forced to swim. At the same time, for others, that would be a recipe for mediocrity and frustration. And I think he's right, that it's not about having a talent that allows you to do all those things in parallel and succeed. It's much more about personality and mindset. And I was reminded of advice we do often give at Musical U with the comparable question of should I try to learn multiple skills at once, for example playing melodies by ear and chords by ear. 
And while we do normally give detailed answers specific to the member in their question, we'd also always preface it by saying, well, it depends. There's no right answer there, and for some people it'll work great to do both in parallel and actually accelerate their progress, while for others it can be much better to focus in on just one, until you reach a good level, and then turn your attention to something new. I think most of us, by the time we're adults, know which of these two camps we fall into. And what I'd love to highlight here is, again, that this isn't about you needing to be good enough to do it, one way or the other. Both are valid, and both can produce amazing results, with the world-famous concert pianist on one end of the spectrum, and somebody like Josh on the other end. I really enjoyed listening to Josh talk about how, at Berkeley, his musical horizons were broadened even further, and I've no doubt that, for some of his classmates, things swung the other direction. Faced with the big expanse of music that they had no real grasp of, I know that many would have instinctively flinched back and focused in on the classical or jazz or other genre that was familiar territory. Clearly that is not the reaction that Josh had, and I think it's exemplary of a couple of things we talked about later in the conversation. The first is his philosophy on learning, that the best way to learn is to become a good learner, and the best, or perhaps the only way to become a good learner, is to keep trying, keep making mistakes, and keep becoming more right. That's easy to say, but not easy to do. And that's the second thing which I think stands out there, that Josh is clearly very adept at putting his ego aside. With his resume and skill set, I think many people would expect him to be a bit aloof, perhaps a bit protective of his areas of expertise. But clearly he's actually the exact opposite. It's not easy to put your ego aside, whether it's in a conversation when you suddenly realize the person you're arguing with is right and you're wrong, or it's in music where you have an opportunity that's a bit beyond your comfort zone or normal expertise, and you choose to go for it rather than retreat back to what's safe. I think that's a really admirable ability, and one I think we would all benefit from cultivating. The ability to step aside and say, it doesn't matter if I'm wrong or made a mistake or I'm not currently good enough. That just shows me the route to becoming better. I think this showed too in his talking about the high school days where he wasn't carefully studying each and every note of every piece for every ensemble. The way he survived it, and even excelled in those groups, was to get really good at what I would call blagging it having a core level of expertise, and then just learning to confidently go for it, even if you're a bit out of your depth. That's obviously paid off hugely for Josh, and as I mentioned in the conversation, it was a major learning point for me too, not just in music, but in life in general. There are arguments for and against the idea of fake it till you make it, but I think the one aspect of it that can't be denied is the huge positive benefit from acting as if you can do it and then finding a way to make it work. That's a theme we've talked about a lot on this show in the context of learning to improvise, and it goes right across music too. You need to push the boundaries to figure out what works, and confidence doesn't need to come from knowing with certainty you will be perfect, but rather knowing you can handle things however they turn out. I don't want to give the impression that Josh only ever blagged his way through. There were a few comments along the way that showed that early on he did put in the hours of practice, particularly to master the fundamental techniques of an instrument. Even with the Native American flute, which he held up as an example of learning a new instrument super fast, notice that he didn't say, I just had someone hand me a flute for the first time as I walked out on stage. He said he took a bit of time to play around with it and figure it out, and then he felt confident about blagging whatever he'd need to. I liked how he distinguished practice in the traditional sense of playing scales and etudes and developing the core muscles and neural pathways required to control an instrument, and what he would typically do before a gig or recording session, which sounds to me like something I would call preparing, if not practicing, and which he described more compellingly as simply playing. I don't want to get too grandiose and dramatic here in my summary, but I think I do want to wrap up just by returning to what Josh himself said was the most important message from our interview, the importance of learning to learn. There were several specific examples here of how that's benefited him and what he means by it, and I think that fundamental mindset shift from what's called a fixed mindset and is all about limiting yourself to what you believe you're naturally capable of versus not, 
and a growth mindset where you believe pretty much everything is learnable and you personally are capable of learning it. That shift from fixed mindset to growth mindset is one of the most powerful, rewarding, and exciting things you can do for your musical life, and your life beyond music too. So I hope this episode has inspired you to push beyond your own comfort zone, whether that means spreading yourself more broadly by taking up new instruments or styles of music, or it means approaching a single, more focused path with a new willingness to make mistakes, put your ego aside, and learn faster than ever before. Be sure to check out Josh's website and his YouTube videos at joshplotnermusic.com, or we'll have direct links in the show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content, exclusive